be sure to like and subscribe to my channel for more great videos, and don't forget to hit that bell notification to alert you for new videos. Ah, Pokemon. A franchise that has been strongly ingrained into the minds of kids and those, including myself, that have grown up with it ever since its very beginning. For over 25 years, the franchise has had a plethora of merchandise that have come and gone in the blink of an eye. From the Think Chip toy line, the Master Trainer board games, to collectible figurines, and various spin-off games. However, there is one product that's so long fallen into obscurity, a majority of fans never knew of its very existence. And today, we'll be taking a look at it. I'm the Media Nutso, and this is the story of the Pokemon Learning League. Okay, so before we begin, I should mention that I have done a video on the Learning League before. It was the very first topic I ever tackled as the Media Nutso. So, why am I talking about it again? Well, in the two years since making that video, and after having done the Humongous Entertainment retrospective, it now pales in comparison. Oh, not to say that I think it's bad, in fact, I feel that I did a decent job with the limited footage that was available at the time, and I'm grateful many people saw it and for the positive reception it received. But I also can't help thinking that it could have been better. Plus, more bits of information have been found, and a lot more footage of it has sprung up. Another thing, you can tell I was relatively new at video editing, and at the time I did the original, I wasn't quite used to recording and hearing my own voice. My delivery on lines was rather bland, I spoke a little too fast, and there were many times where I just mumbled over my words. But hey, you have to learn to crawl before you can walk. So, I thought now was the perfect time to do an updated and improved version. Anywho, to kick this video off, Let's answer the question most of you are probably asking right now. What exactly on earth was the Pokemon Learning League? Well, if the title alone didn't give it away, the Learning League was an educational website running online from September of 2006 to August of 2009 aimed toward upper elementary and early middle school students, it covered 140 lessons across the four main subjects. Math, Science, Life Skills, and Language Arts. There were also four characters, called the Mission Guides, that were created specifically for the website and to cover each main subject. Said Mission Guides were Ciara, who covered Science, Ada, who did Math, Quinn tackled the life skills, and Lex handled the language arts. Also, Ash and the gang were able to contact them via a special gadget, also exclusive to the website, called the Poke Pilot. Also, it's been inferred in some episodes that the mission guides live in a separate universe from the animes, but let's not go that deep. Now, while the thought of Pokemon having an educational product might seem a bit off-putting and laughable, it's worth noting that this would not be the first nor the last time Pokemon would delve into education. Six years before, they collaborated with the learning company, best known for creating Reader Rabbit and the Clue Finders, to make and release the Pokeroms, a set of diskettes that have math-related puzzles and games, and two years after the site shut down, Japan, then later Europe and Australia, 
saw the release of Learn With Pokemon Typing Adventure, where the main gimmick of it was catching Pokemon by correctly typing out their names. Yes, really, and it's about as thrilling and exciting as that title makes it sound. Anyways, one aspect that made the website a unique product was that it was one of the very few that tied in with the anime. Of course, the show is no stranger to having its own line of merchandise. Side story specials, several toys and clothing that featured Ash and his friends, the Pokemon Puzzle League for the Nintendo 64, and some special promo trading cards. But another aspect that really made it distinctive was that it was one of the only American exclusive tie-ins. It didn't see any sort of availability outside of the US, not even in its home country. Now, the plot structure of each episode, which were very episodic, and obviously not canon with the show, were pretty formulaic. The characters have a topic-related problem or situation, or in other cases, get curious about one, Thus, they contact that specific mission guide, who then proceeds to teach them about the topic, and at the end, the game implements their newly gained information to solve their problems. Yep, just lather, rinse, and repeat that for 140 episodes. Though, it'll sometimes shake things up, but we'll get more into that later. Each episode was divided up into three sections. Watch, where they establish the characters, or character, and their problem situation, try, where you do a guided practice run, and apply, where you basically apply what you learned through a minigame, and it concludes with the characters solving their problem. Also, the characters would break the fourth wall in here, but it's really nothing special. It's like you'd see on Door the Explorer. They would ask the player for help, and or say thank you for the assistance. As for the actual plots themselves, they were some of the most cookie-cutter ones you could find, like Ash and Brock having trouble pitching up a tent, Ash not being certain if he can give a fair contest review, Misty having problems with some water tanks, Brock having trouble befriending other girls, seriously. Hey. Well, hello there. Hi! Excuse me, miss? Max and May getting into an argument over Skitty ruining Max's new book, or Dawn wanting to write a poem for Professor Oak as a way to show her admiration for him and his poetry. Ooh, very riveting and exciting sounding stories, huh? Not to mention, the dialogue can get very cheesy and on the nose. Well, I don't really want Ash to miss out on a battle. And it is getting late, so maybe we should just go. No way, May. You're not getting out of this unhappy. Yeah, Don, I'm not sure. Oh, what a bunch of worry warts you all are. Maybe she's an experienced coordinator. Okay, might as well talk about the big elephant in the room. Yes, Don's outfit has been altered, and the character animation is not very good. Although, some episodes were better animated than others. But at the time, Given the kind of schedule the team behind the website had to work with, which we'll get into more in a bit, it was considered passable. As for the backgrounds, you can clearly tell they took screenshots from the anime for that. It's especially obvious when they use ones from the pre-digital colored episodes. Now, with all that being said, this isn't to say the website was entirely bad. On the contrary, it does have several aspects going for it. It did have a few noteworthy episodes. Media was the only two-part story they ever did, the water cycle for officially introducing Dawn onto the site, as well as online safety bringing in Zoe, magnetism for marking one of the very few times a mission guide, in this case Ciara, had a problem, the lunar cycle for being the very first lesson ever made, good sportsmanship for being the only one to show an official battle, etc, etc. Also, having some previous side characters making a return in some episodes was a cool little touch. Now, considering that this was an educational website, 
it wasn't allowed to feature any sort of Pokemon battles. One way they worked around it was by having several of the plots revolve around the gang going to or coming off a battle, or in other cases, preparing for an upcoming contest. Though we don't get to see them competing or even hear the outcomes at the end, or sometimes going to other events or places. The only exceptions are the good sportsmanship episode, as I've already mentioned, and the episode that featured Team Rocket, and whenever the gang was training their Pokémon. Another noteworthy aspect it has going for it, it featured Ash and Co. visiting different regions from episode to episode, similar to what Pokémon Journeys has done. So you'd have one episode where Ash, May, Max, and Brock are visiting Misty in Cerulean City, and in the aforementioned two-part media, they're visiting Goldenrod. The new characters made for the site outside of the mission guides were interesting, though a bit flat and one note. On top of that, there were a good amount of episodes that put the spotlight on other characters besides Ash and Pikachu, and sometimes, the latter two don't even get a mention. That's right, several of them focused on Dawn, Brock, Misty, and even Tracy. So, if anybody wanted to see more adventures of them outside of the side story specials at the time, this site had that covered over 15 years prior. Also, here's a fun trivia note. The cast recorded their lines before any of the animation was done, as opposed to the usual process of recording to already completed footage. That must have been an interesting experience for them. Throughout its original three-year run, the site received great praise from parents and teachers, saying that they loved how it was able to get kids to learn in a fun way, and said that the lessons were interesting and engaging. The reception was so good that the people at Pokemon New York and the site's team were very excited about it. So much so, they later forged a partnership with the Virginia Department of Education to show off its effectiveness, since at the time, Virginia was, in terms of educational tech, very well ahead of the rest of the country. Naturally, their critical success wouldn't go unrewarded, as the site went on to win 14 awards, including, but not limited to, a Bessie Award in the category of Multi-Subject Website for Upper Elementary, an AEP Distinguished Achievement Award, two SIIA Cody Awards, an iParenting Media Award, and even earning the National Parenting Center's seal of approval. Gotta say, that ain't too shabby for a Pokemon-related product. As for how many yearly subscribers it got? Unfortunately, that still remains completely unknown. How come? Well, Pokemon New York never officially disclosed the actual number, so I can only estimate that it was probably around the 20 to 40,000 range. Why at that range? Well, you gotta keep in mind, this was back around 2006 to 2009, a time when sites like ABCMouse.com or The Adventure Academy were even a thought, let alone a thing yet. In fact, the only other educational site around, and the one the Learning League took the most inspiration from, was Brain Pop. Not to mention, it was still a relatively new concept, so there was uncertainty if it would work or even be all that effective. Which, as shown with the aforementioned reception, awards, and partnership, it ultimately proved it could be effective. Also, there's the fact the website didn't receive a whole lot of marketing, and it didn't stay online long enough to get any sort of traction. So, who knows where it would be today if it kept on going? Well, one can only wonder. Okay, so now that we know what the website was all about, it's time to get into the history of where and how this site was conceived. Interestingly and surprisingly, the idea for the website came from the CEO of Pokemon Japan, Tsunekazu Ishihara. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot on when or why he got the idea in the first place. 
but it's most likely that he wanted to further leverage the franchise's potential by letting it venture into different untapped markets. Now to really kick it into high gear after that short segment, let's get into who they got to help bring the website itself to life. Enter the then-executive of 360 Kid, Scott Trailer. When speaking during an educational conference in 2004, Trailer would meet up with another attending speaker, who suggested to him that they should one day collaborate together on a project. Little did he know, that person would go on to be hired by Pokemon New York to help develop an educational website for them. Jumping forward to 2006, and Pokemon is in the midst of celebrating its 10th anniversary, along with the release of Pokemon Troze for the DS. However, while all of this celebration was going on, behind the scenes, there were some big changes taking place, mainly with the dub of the anime. By that time, the show had been taken off of Kids WB following the end of Advanced Battle, would start airing new seasons on Cartoon Network for an entire decade before it jumped ship over to Disney XD and then later Netflix, and the biggest and most controversial change of them all, in an effort to lower production costs, the anime's English dub cast was changed from 4Kids Entertainment to Pokemon USA in-house. I won't be covering it here, but suffice it to say, this change really didn't sit well with a lot of fans, nor with some of the original cast members. Anyways, back on to the Learning League, during the beginning of its development, Pokemon New York selected three companies to create one Ed video, with 360 Kid being among those three. And out of the possible candidates, 360 Kid would ultimately be the one selected, due to them having, at the time, the best audio recording, animation, character development, and educational content writing. When the crew got the news that they were going to do the website, you better believe they were quite excited about it. After all, who wouldn't be excited about working with Pokemon? Afterwards, Pokemon New York would ask them to make 12 Ed Video episodes, to which one of their contacts would give them a list of topics to work with and thus they began the educational research and writing process. From there, they'd send them back to their Pokemon New York contacts for approval. Later on, that number would double to 24, and then to 40. Interestingly enough, at the start of production, 360 Kid only had one producer managing the whole project, and since it proved to be so big, especially since the site initially launched with 40 Ed videos, they had to bring on board a full-time associate producer shortly afterwards. Also, their team consisted of only 12 people working in shifts, as well as having to start on a new Ed video every week. So, you can imagine it was a very heavy workload. Now, the team's goal for the site was to turn out one new Ed video every six weeks but that would prove to be a bit of a challenge. Initially, they planned for each episode to be around 3 minutes long, but as they quickly learned, some of the lessons took longer to break down than others. As a result, the more complex the topic was, the longer it took to complete one Ed video. In fact, they had to speed up production so much that toward the end, their storyboards went from being beautiful renderings to just stick figures. Not even kidding about that. Also, all of the work for the back-end database was developed by Entropy Multimedia. As for the animation process itself, it was certainly a unique and complicated one. 360 Kid had one full-time animator on staff with the task of doing a minute's worth of animation in just one week. Yes, one person had to animate a whole minute with all the characters in just a single week. That is insane! Fortunately though, they did get some additional help from another company, two animators, who also developed the large vector art library. 
This is why the final animation looks as it does on the final site. Oh, and to further speed up production, they intentionally left off a good amount of the character's shading and casting shadows. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the site was not allowed to showcase any Pokemon battles. However, it's worth mentioning that this was a decision that came from Pokemon New York themselves. See, at one point, the crew at 360 Kid almost turned the project down because they thought the battles would be included. But Pokemon New York guaranteed them that there wouldn't be any battles in it whatsoever, apart from the exceptions I mentioned earlier. This was good for both them and especially for Pokemon's PR, as this was around the time several schools were banning a lot of Pokemon products from being seen on campus, including t-shirts and backpacks. That there ought to tell you how strong of a negative stance schools have for the franchise around that time. Once the website came around though, that stance changed and the bans were revoked. Now, one notable aspect I'd like to add is that the cyberbullying and online safety episodes were made as a result of a mandate from the US Department of Education. However, the final result would be quite fortuitous, as more schools began taking notice of the website, since at the time, no other educational company had offered to cover those topics. Just goes to show how much ingenuity the crew had for it. Now, if you've been paying attention to the clips, you've no doubt noticed one element is missing from them. I can't believe you can make that happen in a lab. Anything's possible. Oh yeah, I think I just felt a raindrop. There's no background music playing in them. Why is that? Well, believe it or not, the team initially did compose a score for the site that would have been very Pokemon-esque. But during a testing, the teachers found it to be too loud and distracting, so it was removed from the final product. But that wasn't the only note they got from it. They also learned the teachers weren't too keen on Misty's short skirt, so they modified it to be more of a short pants skirt. This also explains why Dawn's outfit was altered when she was eventually introduced to the site. Honestly, it was a good thing they did because you could imagine those teachers would have thrown a fit with the website had they kept Dawn's outfit as it originally was in the anime. Anyways, for certain lessons, the team had to rework and rewrite some of the ed videos in order to correlate the educational material to certain state standards, as each one had varying standards on some of the topics the site covered. On a side note, the team wanted to include a gaming mechanic, e.g. earning a coin or points each time one successfully completed a lesson, and even wanted to offer t-shirt iron-ons, but none of these ever came to fruition, except for the point mechanic, that was added later in the run. So, given the site's overall positive reception and the recognition it was receiving, why did it shut down in the first place? Well, this was because Pokemon New York had gone through a management changeup, and the new CEO of the company wasn't all that keen on the idea of Pokemon having an educational product, so he decided to pull the plug on it. This was met with a lot of resistance from the staff at both 360 Kid and inside Pokemon New York, but it was to no avail, and the site was ultimately shut down in August of 2009. Interestingly, had the website been allowed to continue on, the crew wanted to take it in a more socially emotional direction, teaching about good friendship tips and learning to be kinder, but with a more Japanese approach. It's kind of sad really, the Learning League still had a lot of untapped potential waiting to be unleashed. But alas, it was never given the opportunity to fully blossom. However, that's not where this story ends. Following the site's closure, Pokemon USA, now TCPI, sold off all of the assets to Paws Inc., the company behind Garfield, and in collaboration with the Virginia Department of Education, 
the site was relaunched as the Infinite Learning Lab. There's really not much to say about it. It was basically the same site as before, but just switch out the Pokemon cast with the Garfield cast. This incarnation had been running for at least a decade, until it was officially closed down on July 1st, 2020. In the years following the Learning League shutdown, it had very much fallen into obscurity. In fact, for a very long time, the only evidence of its existence were a few screenshots from a few episodes, and a few promo pages from various websites. It looked like that was all there was going to be. That was until 2015, when a YouTuber, LARG, found and uploaded the watch portion of the Water Cycle episode. Then, two years later, found two more clips, both of which were also watch segments. One from the Making Friends episode, and one from the Online Safety episode. However, the biggest find came on January 17, 2021, when a user of the Lost Media Forums, Amit Call, uploaded all of the files on archive.org, right around the site's 15th anniversary. And I do mean everything. Not just the video files, but also the site's layout, video player, buttons, PDF files, etc, etc. In conclusion, the Pokemon Learning League was a very flawed, but overall enjoyable website. Sure, the plots were cookie cutter and formulaic, much of the dialogue was pretty corny and cheesy, and the animation wasn't the best, but it made up for it by handling the lessons pretty well, for the most part, and it was interesting seeing a Pokemon product stepping out of the franchise's comfort zone and doing something more experimental. If you're curious, I highly recommend going to the Pokemon Learning League Archive YouTube channel and see what it was like. Or if you want to try the lessons for yourselves, head on over to archive.org and download them, as well as the Flash Player needed to play the files. I hope you all enjoyed this video and that it helped give you an insight into one of the most fascinating pieces of forgotten Pokemon paraphernalia out there. Thank you.